Welcome everybody to the third episode in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. My name is Jacob Sondergaard and I will be your host today. Today we're talking about voice quality source signals, specifically this type of signals that we use for testing communication devices. Today's agenda, pretty straightforward. We'll talk about the types of signal that we use for voice quality testing or, or conversational quality testing. We'll talk about calibration issues like scaling the signals. We'll briefly touch on a few of the special filtering situations that we do have to account for. Then we'll put a nice bow on it, wrap it up, send you on your way. Now, when we talk about testing a communication device, what we typically do is what we call system analysis. We present a known stimulus signal to a black box device and we look at the output. If we do some super sophisticated output divided by input, we can thereby get a sense of what the device in the middle is actually doing to our signal. So the first thing we'll need here is of course a source signal to uh, stimulate or excite our device under test. And so a typical scenario might look something like this. On the left hand side, we have a stimulus signal. This one happens to look like noisy speech. We feed that into our device under test, which as you know, can be quite sophisticated. We will have typically some form of noise suppression, maybe some spectral shaping, echo cancellation, AGC or automatic gain control etc etc and then on the output we get a nice clean speech signal that we want to compare to our input to do our analysis and figure out how did our device perform now what this webinar is really all about is the second bullet point it's about the type of stimulus signal that we can use because we can't just throw any old signal at a device and expect appropriate behavior and appropriate responses we have to consider not just the frequency content and level but also things like the temporal uh, content of the signal and the thing that we have to keep in mind with communication devices is that they are designed to handle extremely complex signals i.e. human voice. We're not talking about a mechanical system where we're looking for, let's say, resonant frequencies where we can play or stimulate or excite the mechanical system with a pure tone stimulus signal and look for that resonance. We're talking about extremely complex things here and we have to design our system and our test cases accordingly. So if we start in the beginning of time, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we were fortunate enough to be able to use very simple source signals. Some of those source signals could have been pure tones, you know, like sine waves or sweeps. We could have used multi signs or even something like white noise or pseudo random noise if we were a little more sophisticated. And this was great because these signals are all incredibly easy to generate they're easy to quantify and at the time most of the devices available to us even communication devices really didn't have a ton of processing on board they were rather simple and they would accept these signals and churn through and crank through their internal processing and behave as if they were exposed to regular speech and so we could easily do our usual output divided by input to figure out what the device was doing. And that was great. The problem, of course, is modern devices have a lot more onboard processing to where these types of signals won't always get accepted or they won't get accepted in their entirety without being in some way, shape or form suppressed or modulated by the device. And so that leads us to the next slide here where we come to the realization that we are gravitating 
more towards realistic sounds. And so if you take a quick look at the graphs on the, on the, um, on the slide here, you see on the left-hand side, we have a real speech stimulus signal. So just looking at it, you can tell crest factor is high. Remember our last webinar, we talked about things like the period, peak, um, peak to peak RMS values, and of course, crest factor. Speech has a very high crest factor. You can see it here. You can see the temporal aspects of the signal looks like speech. On the right-hand side in green, we have something called a CSS burst, a composite source signal which looks deceptively simple, but actually still has its use cases today. Now, the key thing, of course, is we can use these signals on modern devices and get realistic behavior, get the appropriate processing applied, and do our calculation, um, and do the calculation we need to do to figure out what is the device doing, how is it performing, can we benchmark it against other devices. So if we just give you a quick high-level overview of the different signals that we have available to us, we can dive into each of them and then dissect them a little bit and learn more about them. So the first one I want to share with you is the artificial voice. This is standardized in ITUT P50. If you've ever heard it and if you've ever watched Charlie Brown, I think our U.S. audience may be familiar with Charlie Brown, but whenever a teacher or an adult or a grown-up in the show used to talk, it sounds suspiciously like the P50 voice. It's kind of a mwah, 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 mwah. It's completely unintelligible, uh, but it does have a lot of the spectral and temporal aspects of real speech. The key thing about P50, the artificial voice, though, is it isn't actually speech. It's sort of a universal speech-like stimulus. It's a combination of many different languages of both male and female voices boiled into one stimulus signal so that it doesn't actually resemble any one in particular, but sort of takes an average of all speech-like signals. And what we find when we analyze the, when we perform an FFT of the signal is we do have certainly enough frequency content to appropriately stress narrowband devices and wideband devices. Now note, there's nothing here about super wideband and full band. So the other one I want to share with you is the composite source signal or the CSS burst, which again is standardized in ITUT P50. This one is though completely artificial. There's no real speech-like components in there when, when, you, when you visually look at the time signal or even audibly when you listen to it. However, even though it sounds like static, the ch -ch -ch burst, there is actually, when we analyze it, you can see that there are some vocalizations or voice-like components in there, which can make them appropriate for modern communication devices. Now, one of the cool things about the CSS burst is we do have more high-frequency content, which means for things like wide bands or HD voice or super wide band like HD voice plus or other terminology like it, it can be appropriate for testing those devices. And because this is a completely artificial signal, mathematically formulated and generated, it does mean it's very deterministic and easy to generate and uh, easy to use. The third one, is real speech and in this case I think the first bullet point says it all this is what we want to use this is our preferred source signal this is what we gravitate towards as much as possible if you have been in the industry for anything more than let's say four or five years you might have seen the slow progression and the standards as they evolve and they move away from well, pure tones, of course, but even into the P50 CSS burst domain and progressing beyond that into real speech. This is where we are going as an industry. It doesn't come without its challenges, of course, because I'm sitting here talking to you in English and using an English stimulus file will be good if you're making a product for 
the English speaking world. But if you are working with Mandarin, French, German, Danish, what have you, then you'll know that the languages differ tremendously. And so ideally, if you are tuning for local markets, you should be using local languages that really stress the devices appropriately because of the differences found in language. Uh, now, the cool thing about real speech, as you know, it's easy to understand as a human being. So for all the cool metrics that we'll be covering the next weeks, if you find that you have difficulty understanding why a result was uh, scored the way it was scored, the easiest thing to do is stick on a pair of headphones, play back the real speech as it went through your device, and listen to the result. You be the judge. And that's one of the beauties of real speech. We can analyze it subjectively as humans, whereas <laughs> you try and listen to the Charlie Brown artificial voice and see if you can detect any distortion or clipping or anything like that. It is in, in, it's incredibly difficult when it's complete nonsense content. Um, and so a quick side note here, and maybe we'll get to this in a little bit, but uh, if you're familiar with the terminology Harvard sentences, it, ITU, again, in P501, I guess I should have added this to the slide, there are a whole bunch of real speech stimulus files that are standardized by ITU, and they do come in different languages. It just so happens we tend to use the English language primarily in what we do, but we do have French, different ver versions of Chinese, Japanese. There are different languages out there standardized in ITU P501. So make sure you take a look at those as well. Finally, the fourth type of test signal I want to share with you and talk about today are the real corner case situations where we need some highly specialized signals. This is for real, I don't want to say weird test cases because they are quite useful. They're just not used as often. But we do have some oddball type of specialized signals we use for those situations. So let's dive in and take a look at, we'll start with the P50 artificial voice. First thing I want to direct your attention to is the top half of the graph where you can see the time domain analysis of the P50 voice. So first thing, gut reaction. Does it look like real speech? Yeah, it kind of does look like real speech, right? It, it has that same balance of uh, peaks to silences in between what we would call maybe words and utterances. The crest factor is relatively high on par with real speech. And if you look on the bottom half of the of the graph you'll see a spectrogram so the fft spectrum versus time and that you can see if you go vertical on the on the y-axis that we do actually have a lot of amplitude a lot of level even pretty far out in the frequency domain so pretty similar to real speech now let me switch over my audio channel so that i can play the charlie brown speech for you All right, so how did that sound? If you're familiar with Charlie Brown, I think it sounds pretty much exactly like Charlie Brown's teacher. But that's the essence of it. You can you can hear that it's it's supposed to be like speech. It's like if aliens came to Earth and wanted to speak one univer universal language, it seems like this is the speech they would use, right? It's kind of that blend of all types of languages just rolled into one. So you can see the purpose and the intent here. And because it is a little bit contrived and artificially constructed, there's quite a lot of known uh, known attributes about it. The second one I want to talk about is the composite source signal, the CSS burst. Uh, 
So in this case, what we typically do is we have a sequence of a few bursts, somewhere between three and four bursts. In this case, in the time domain, you can see we have four bursts lined up. What's the first thing that strikes you? It might be that each burst is really, really short. We're dealing here with 250 milliseconds worth of a burst of audio data or, or speech-like data. And we have four of those, which means an entire test stimulus signal is only two seconds long. And so you can immediately start to see, ah, this might be useful for somewhere where we just have to get some data really quickly where we aren't necessarily too concerned about was it a pure speech-like signal, right? The speed aspect here of CSS burst testing is very appealing. The other thing is when you look at the frequency content of a CSS burst is you can see it extends pretty high out on the x-axis down on the bottom graph, right? We have content way out towards 10K or even above. And otherwise, it doesn't, the overall spectral content doesn't differ that much from real speech. Now, let me play this for you and you can get a sense of what it sounds like to the human ear. So whenever I play that file back, I can't hear it myself. So I'm always curious how it turns out on your end because GoToWebinar actually has a built-in noise suppression algorithm. So once we play some of these signals that aren't entirely speech-like, we run the risk of having them suppressed. But hopefully you're able to detect that it sounds a lot like a static burst of noise. Sort of like that. Now, if we put on our CSI caps or hats and we yell out enhance, you know how they enhance the crime scene and they zoom in? Let's take a closer look at what is the CSS burst um, comprised of. And without playing the burst again, what I'll do instead is I'll highlight the two different portions of one burst. The first thing is, this is really hard to detect when you play the whole thing, but the first portion, only 50 odd milliseconds worth of data, is actually something that we call a vocalization, which is intended to sound a lot like maybe the beginning of a vowel or a real word, followed by about 200 milliseconds of pseudo noise, where you can see the spectral content here that's really what we're after here. We're after a relatively broadband type of noise stimulus that matches roughly what real speech would look like so that we can test all frequency aspects of the device. But in order to pass through that pseudo noise into modern devices, we desperately need the vocalization in the beginning in order to trick the device into thinking, hey, Speech is coming. Let me make sure everything, all my communication and audio paths are open, AGCs converged, and noise suppression isn't too aggressive on this subsequent bit. All right, so that's the idea with the CSS burst. I'll play the two individual portions here just so you can hear them broken up into individual slices. So I don't know if you've ever had a chance to do that before, but you can definitely hear the difference between the vocalization portion and the pseudo noise portion. And maybe now you can see why it's constructed this way. So the guys that designed the CSS burst, there was some good forethought into how the signal was designed exactly. And then maybe tells you why we can use it in many cases today. Now let's compare the P50 artificial voice with the CSS burst. The first thing I want to say is it's when you compare the two, it's not that there's a 
right or wrong. It's just that these are different stimulus signals that we have available to us. And as I mentioned before, the CSS burst on the left-hand side, the time domain aspect, the fact that it is very, very quick, very fast, is appealing to us. Likewise, the high frequency cutoff gives us more flexibility in terms of what transmission path or bandwidth limitation we can test using the CSS burst versus something like the P50 voice. So if we do a quick comparison here on the bottom left, you can see that the P50 voice just does not have the same high frequency extension that we find with the CSS burst. Now, where does that come into play? Because you know a lot of human uh, voice or speech energy, there's not too much focused above the eight to 10K range anyway, but there are a few elements up there, things like sibilances. And I don't know if you're familiar with what a sibilance is, but a sibilance is part of speech that actually does not stimulate your voice box. So usually when you talk, you you exhale or you push air out of your lungs through your voice box. Your voice box will tension up and basically resonate to generate the different vowels and consonants that we want. Now, of course, we use our tongue and teeth and lips and everything to help shape those sounds. But when you talk and you put your, let's put your fingers up to your voice box, you can feel that your voice box vibrates. Now, with sibilances, so like the S in snakes, if you make that noise, you'll notice that your voice box is not vibrating. So I want everybody to put your hands up to your voice box and just say, S -s -s, make the S sound. Everyone in the office is going to think you're nuts. But I want you to feel that your voice box is actually not vibrating here. And this is all, those S sounds in particular, they have a lot of the high frequency content. Now you can imagine if we use something like the P50 voice that rolls off pretty sharply at around 8K, we're not capturing all of those S sounds. And so if you are testing devices that are super wide band capable and you really want to capture those sibilances, then you really ought to have a stimulus signal that also stimulates those frequency ranges to ensure that you account for those in your device performance. So let's look at the artificial speech versus real speech. The, on the left side, we have the little block that outlines the real speech advantages. I'll just highlight a few of them because we've touched on them already. But the number one thing is, A, it's realistic. This is what the real device, phone, tablet, smart TV, smart speaker, whatever, will be exposed to. It's real speech, people talking to it. And B, it's quote-unquote future-proof. Presumably, our languages won't evolve <laughs> that drastically. We will always be using some form of real speech to communicate. We want to grade into a Morse code. But the idea is that if we use real speech now, almost regardless of what the processing will look like in the future, real speech will still be the preferred stimulus method going forward. And let me just highlight one more, and that is even though we're getting incredibly sophisticated with our analysis methods and our test software and our A to D hardware, there's still just a large gap between what the human ears and the human brain are capable of. And if you are using real speech as your stimulus signal, you have the ability to listen to it as well. So those are sort of the three key advantages of real speech. However, that's not to say that artificial speech signals don't serve a purpose because, for instance, with the CSS burst, we have the time domain effect of the fact that it's really short working in our favor in some cases. Or the fact that they are incredibly well-defined and standardized sequences. And so if somebody in Sweden is using a P50 artificial voice or CSS burst and somebody in China is using a CSS burst and they're both making products going into the French market, then 
however they tune their device, as long as they're using the same stimulus signal, they'll end up with the same outcome. Whereas using obviously Swedish language versus Mandarin and then targeting it for the French market could cause some issues. So artificial speech definitely has its advantages as well. Now, let's get into the ITUP 501 real speech. Those were the Harvard sentences that I touched on earlier. The key with, I guess, where the Harvard comes from is it, it's, I don't think they were designed by Harvard, but it sounds certainly a lot like it's a, it's a proper spoken English. The sentences, first of all, are recorded cleanly. So when you listen to the files, you won't hear any wind noise in the background or any background noise in general. You also won't hear any of the popping peas because the speaker was close to the mic. And so actually, coincidentally, today I'm sitting with a headset that has a boom mic on it. The boom mic doesn't go exactly down to my mouth reference point, like right in front of my mouth. But I'm just curious if you guys are detecting any popping peas when I'm, you know, excitedly yelling into my headset here. In any case, when you listen to the P501 real speech, you won't hear any of those popping beats. They're very pure, clean recordings. People enunciate very well. They pronounce it very well. And they are standardized in ITU P501. They have a specific structure where you have to use a male voice, a female voice, alternating between the two. Now, another thing is when the group of people, the experts that sat down and said, hey, we need to choose appropriate sentences to use in these Harvard sentences. We can't just use any old sentence. What they also came up with was that the frequency content had to be pretty broad. So they had to use sentences that stress the whole frequency spectrum as much as possible. They also chose sentences that are phonetically balanced, and so they really touch on all of the different fricatives and syllables in each of the languages. And of course, that each of the sentences will have crest factors that are representative of real speech. So even though the sentences are a little bit contrived and artificially generated, the overall sentences are really representative of real spoken language. So you can see. Uh, the graph here shows you the spectral content of the female voices on the left-hand side. They have a little bit more high-frequency content. And the male voices on the right side, which have a little bit lower frequency content, that is certainly representative of the average female and male um, spectral shapes. But also the crest factors. If you look at each of the sentences or each of the utterances individual, the crest factors varies from about 14 dB to 22 dB, which certainly is way more than a sine wave, which is this 3 dB crest factor. And if you take the average of all the Harvard sentences, we end up with a crest factor of 17.4 dB. So very, very uh, good correlation with the average of actual real speech. Now let's take a look at the corner cases. The corner cases, as I mentioned, are not used that much anymore because these source signals, some of them, first of all, aren't standardized. Secondly, they aren't real speech signals. And as we've already touched on, a lot of the standards and a lot of the test software out there have all gravitated towards using real speech. So these specialized source signals have a little bit been left behind in the dust but we'll take a look at them and you can see that they are extremely customized just for individual portions of the audio path in a communication device so the first one on the bottom left here is what i would call the mosquito buzz it is a test stimulus signal you can see in the time domain that we have two time signals we have a red signal and a green signal and it varies has both am and fm modulation but the green signal so the downlink direction signal stretches the entire uh, stimulus 
signal where the uplink signal really just is a short overlap. I'll play it for you in a minute. It sounds like a swarm of angry bees or mosquitoes coming to get you. And the point of this is to test echo behavior and look at the spectral content of your echo canceller. So it's actually a pretty neat signal and a pretty cool test to do. The only downside is that potentially, if you're testing a black box communication device, the noise suppressor will get in the way and unfortunately not allow the signal to get through, reach the echo, uh, echo cancer and give you accurate data on the back end. But hey, if you're testing just a echo cancer standalone, this might be a useful test for you. So let me switch over my audio and I'll play it for you. So hopefully that came through. Uh, if the go to webinar noise suppressor was too aggressive, the best thing I can tell you is it sounds exactly just like a bunch of mosquitoes or bees coming to get you. The other one, specialized test signal I want to highlight is the one on the bottom right. It's sort of a V-shaped type signal that starts at very high amplitude decreases to zero after a couple seconds and then goes back up to maximum amplitude at the end of the signal. The reason for this type of stimulus signal is to verify the AGC performance. So as things decrease, as the signal decreases, we can track the level versus time of both obviously our source signal and our resulting signal in the send direction to see how the AGC performs. The, if we were to take a small slice of the stimulus signal and look at it in the frequency domain, you'll see that it looks a lot like the vocalization point or, or portion of the CSS burst. So it isn't just static noise that we decrease in amplitude. It is meant to be something that looks like um, that looks like a vocalization, but still I have encountered several of our customers that expressed that unfortunately they cannot use this stimulus signal anymore for AGC testing because their device rejects it or doesn't pass it through cleanly anymore. Now, we touched a little bit on the whole idea of DB references before, but just to give you a nice slide that you guys can print out and hang in the lab, here are the key references that we use in telecommunications. On the acoustic side, remember, we talk about dBPA, or that is dB reference to one Pascal. If you're used to doing things with a sound level meter out and about, then you're used to the dB SPL measurement, where instead we reference 20 micropascal. The measurements themselves are completely interchangeable as long as you account for the 94 dB difference between dBPA and dB SPL. That's on the acoustic side, the physical side. On the electrical side, we talk about volts. And we use dBV or, so for dB volts relative to volts, or we use dBm where the M actually is a reference to milliwatts. On the bottom here, some of the other terms that we use is dBm0, for a lot of people, including myself, we prefer to say dBmo. And dBmo is just the amount relative to a somewhat arbitrary zero transmission point. Uh, anything above that zero point will be characterized as a gain in dBm. And anything below it will be characterized as a attenuation. So you guys recall that Typically, we will scale signals in the acoustic domain as minus 4.7 dBPA, or roughly 89.3 dB SPL. In the electrical domain, we will typically scale signals at minus 16 dBmO. So relative to the arbitrary zero transmission point, we go 16 dB down when we scale our signals electrically. <laughs> 
The other one, we don't use it as much for telecommunications, but in the digital domain, you might encounter DBOV or DBFS. The two are interchangeable. DBOV is just the DB relative to the overload point, which is exactly the same as the DB full scale. So DB reference to full scale. That's, tip, that's what's used in, for instance, wave files. And the issue with wave files and using DBFS or DBOV is we lose the SI notation on the y-axis. We don't have any physical units anymore. Everything is just relative to the overload point or the full scale point. And so when you move between calibrated files and wave files, you, oft, you always have to take note of what is your calibration factor in case you have to go back. Because once you go to wave, everything is just relative to full scale and you sort of you lose that absolute um, absolute scale now while we're talking about db we have put together what we consider a pretty helpful slide that shows you the typical conversions back and forth so for 0 dbpa that's the same as one pascal or 94 db spl that's where the 94 db comes from For 0 dBm, we because we're talking about watts, and you can't have watts without specifying a impedance or a resistance, we have to specify the impedance used. And I've given you two here. So 0 dBm is equivalent to minus 2.2 dBv at 600 ohms or minus 0.0, uh, pi, minus 0.5 dBV at 900 ohms. The reason why we have those two is way back in the day, the tele telecommunications networks in North America had a 600 ohm impedance, whereas in Europe, they had a 900 ohm impedance. So zero dBm wasn't the same depending on where you were in the world, which can get confusing. And now if you look at the chart below, we have some of the typical codex specified where the idea is the overload point with let's say an ALOG codec like G711 if you're feeding through a signal of 3.14 dBmO it is going to hit the rails so it's going to be equivalent to uh, a DBFS, a full scale signal in the digital domain, and likewise on down. And you can see G722, of course, is sort of the oddball in terms of codex. Everything else is around the 3 dBmO plus 3 dBmO mark. G722 is the oddball at, at 9, and that causes a lot of frustration and a lot of headaches when people have to interface and they switch codex between L16 or Opus or something else and G722. Now ITU does provide some help and guidance. So if you wanna take a deeper dive, you're welcome to follow the links here and, uh, and take a closer look. But this is just meant to be a helpful slide for your work. So remember we talked about the time signal, the descriptors that we use for pure tones. where we talked about peak and RMS and the rule of thumb for pure tones. Of course, for the speech-like signals, we use the same terminology, although we apply it just a little bit differently. And what I would like to talk about more is the scaling of these signals using RMS, which is the common way to do it, in pure acoustics or electrically or just mathematically versus the active speech level adjustment or scaling that we use in telecommunications. So this is the smarter way of doing RMS averaging. This is where the algorithm defined in P56 will remove all the silences in a speech signal because we know speech signals will contain a lot of silences that shouldn't impact the scaling of our speech signals 
And so it will remove all those silences, only look at the speech portions, so we can do our scaling accordingly. And so when we specify the levels, the minus 16 dB MO, the minus 4.7 dB PA, we're always talking about active speech level or ASL scaling. We're not talking about RMS. And to highlight the differences, here is a graph that shows you in the time domain a person saying the utterance five, five, five of varying amplitudes or increasing amplitudes. Obviously, there's a lot of pauses in between. The whole stimulus is about 14 seconds long, give or take. But you can see there's only about 10 or so actual spoken words in a 14 second period. So there's a lot of silence. Now, if we take the different calculation methods available to us, and we analyze the overall RMS level on the left-hand side, you can see we get minus 20 dBPA, so that's roughly 74 dBSPL. And if we use the active speech level calculation, you can see that we end up with a level of minus 15 dBPA. In other words, there's almost a 5 dB difference between using the ASL method of scaling things and the RMS method of scaling things. And so when we tell you, please scale your signals, or when the standards bodies are saying, hey, all signals should be scaled according to this particular level, minus 16 dBmO, minus 4.7 dBPA, if you're using the incorrect method of scaling, you'll be off by about 5 dB roughly, depending on your stimulus signal. But it just goes to show the differences between the two. Now, if you were with us last week, you may have heard this one. I won't play it again for you. But when we looked at the reduction or the data analysis and the reduction in data, we looked at the time domain signal. And we were trying to estimate what was going on there. And looking at the FFT, we're able to say pretty easily, for those in the business, oh, it looks like it went through a narrow band um, filter. So the reason for bringing this up now, when we come, when we talk about the voice signals used for communication devices, is because there are certain cases where we have to band pass our stimulus signals. So these special filtering situations is for when we want to either do a comparison of our output to our input where we don't necessarily want our output signal to be unfairly graded against the input signal because it's not due to the device doing anything but because our input signal may be passed through a network that was, let's say, narrowband limited. And if we have a full band signal as our stimulus signal, we send it through a network that completely band limits it down to 300 hertz to 3400 hertz in the extreme narrowband case. Then our device handles it and plays it back and we can evaluate that. It's not fair to evaluate what's happening between 3400 hertz out to 20k in the resulting measured signal versus the clean full band stimulus because it's of no fault of the device. This is something that the network in this case imposed on us. And so some of the filters that we have available to us for these types of tests are the IRS filters and the Emson filter. So IRS stands for Intermediate Reference System and is something that is defined in ITUTP48. It is meant to simulate a good old POTS network, plain old telephone system network. There are two types of IRS filters. There is one for the sending direction and one for the receiving direction. So it actually matters which way you are going. Now please note, these filters are only used for narrowband connections. There is no wideband or super wideband because the old networks 
just were narrowband. They were band limited at 3400 hertz. So in the case where we are testing something going through a literally an IRS filter or a network, a narrowband network, we would use the corresponding IRS filter from P48 on our stimulus signal so that we can do a fair comparison. What's more likely for you guys to use today, oh, excuse me, quick, <laughs> quick look at the implementation of an IRS filter. For those that want more details, feel free to do the deep dive. But what's more likely for you guys to do today is to look at the EMSIN or the mobile station in filter. And this is something that's defined in G191, ITUT G191. It is the more modern approach and something that is used for mobile networks. Once again, the true definition in G191 of an, of an Emson filter is a narrow band filter only. So it rolls off at 3400 hertz in the shape so, shown on the graph here. So the four points that I want to leave you with when we talk about the type of stimulus signals used for voice communication is that we have to consider carefully which of the many signals available to us, which one we should apply for our device under test. Each of them, of course, have their pros and cons. In some cases, a nice quick CSS burst works sufficiently well for something like, let's say, a delay measurement. But if you're looking to do something more sophisticated, testing echo cancelers or noise suppressors, you preferably want something like real speech. The third point is scaling is very important because if we are using the incorrect method of scaling our signals, everything will be shifted and off by several dB, probably upwards of 5 dB in the worst case scenario. So please take note that for most telecommunication applications, we talk about the active speech level defined in P56. And then finally, for some of our special situations, we do filter our signals according to the IRS filters in, in P48 or the Emson filter in G191. So with that, I thank you very much for your attendance. We hope to see you again online next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.